Brothers and sisters, would you please join with me in our responsive call to worship? The Spirit descends like a dove, bringing peace to unite the world in a just and caring community. The Spirit comes like a breath, bringing life to renew the people of God. The Spirit spreads like fire, bringing energy for witnessing to the love of God. Spirit of the living God, come to us and transform our lives by your power. Our prayer of praise and adoration. Come, Spirit of truth, fill our hearts. May that which was of stone now be transformed into life. Come, Spirit of life, change our hearts. May we who receive your light dwell together in your love. Come, Spirit of love, soften our hearts. Bestow your compassion on those who suffer in mind, spirit, and body. Come, Spirit of hope, heal our hearts. Make us bold to bring light to the dark places, warmth to the cold places, and love to the empty places. Come, Spirit of faith, strengthen our hearts. Spirit of the living God, fill our hearts, minds, and souls to overflowing. Come, Spirit of God, move in our hearts. Our God, we are your people, celebrating the mystery of your never-ending love. Here our call to confession. The God revealed to us in scripture is a welcoming and inclusive God who directs us to love one another. We seek to remove all the barriers that keep us from God and from one another. Come now and confess all that separates you from others and from God. Please join me in our prayer of confession. Lamb of God, we come because you have called, but we're not ready for the banquet. We've not arrived on time. We've not brought the right gifts. We don't have the beautiful wedding garments that are expected at a party such as this. Sometimes we even turn down the invitation. Forgive us, make us new. Give us mercy and grace to dress us with your righteousness. Help us to realize the marvelous welcome that you have for all of us.
friends, as we prepare to hear the word of the Lord, please listen in to our prayer of illumination. Holy Spirit, sacred breath, move through our hearts. Unlock a song within your people. Breathe into us your hopes and dreams for a world filled with justice, love, and peace. Amen. Our first reading today comes from Psalm 97. In it we hear of the glory of God's reign. The Lord is king, let the earth rejoice. Let the many coastlands be glad. Clouds and thick darkness are all around him. Righteousness and justice are the foundation of his throne. Fire goes before him and consumes his adversaries on every side. His lightnings light up the world. The earth sees and trembles. The mountains melt like wax before the Lord, before the Lord of all the earth. The heavens proclaim his righteousness, and all the peoples behold his glory. All worshipers of images are put to shame, those who make their boast in worthless idols. All gods did bow before him. Zion hears and is glad, and the towns of Judah rejoice because of your judgments, O God. For you, O Lord, are the most high over all the earth. You are exalted far above all gods. The Lord loves those who hate evil. He guards the lives of the faithful. He rescues them from the hand of the wicked. Light dawns for the righteous and joy for the upright in heart. Rejoice in the Lord, O you righteous, and give thanks to his holy name. Our second reading today game comes from the book of Nehemiah, chapter 4, verses 1 through 6. Here we're, we hear of hostile plots thwarted. Now when Sambalat heard that we were building the wall, he was angry and greatly enraged, and he mocked the Jews. He said in the presence of his associates and of the army of Samaria, What are these feeble Jews doing? Will they restore things? Will they sacrifice? Will they finish it in a day? Will they revive the stones out of the heaps of rubbish and burn ones at that? Tobiah the Ammonite was beside him and said, That stone wall they are building, any fox going up on it will break it down. Hear, O God, for we are despised. Turn their taunt back on their own heads and give them over as a plunder in a, in a land of captivity. Do not cover their guilt and do not let their sin be blotted out from your sight, for they have hurled insults in the face of the builders. So we rebuilt the wall, and all the wall was joined together to half its height, for the people had a mind to work. Have you ever been criticized for doing the will of God? I have, and it usually comes from the least expected sources. It's always designed to catch you kind of off guard. Maybe your words have been twisted around, or maybe your motivations were misinterpreted. Maybe they disagree entirely with what you're doing. There's a really high cost for spiritual leadership. You're out front, and you're an easy target. J. Oswald Sanders said this, no leader is exempt from criticism, and his humility will nowhere be seen more clearly than in the manner in which he accepts and reacts to it. Nehemiah chapter 4 opens with the walls of Jerusalem being rebuilt, and the opposition is gathering its forces. Every group has its Sanballat and Tobiah. And as we study this chapter, it's obvious that the enemy's tactics have not changed since Nehemiah's day. This is a good time to remind ourselves that we're rebuilding a wall. But God is the architect, and Nehemiah was the contractor. God was at work, and it was his will to rebuild the wall and the gates of the city. Anyone in opposition to that was in opposition to God. But he faced opposition. 
Nehemiah was determined that no one but God would stop the work. Good spiritual leaders need to have a thick skin. But if there's no opposition, the chances are you're not rebuilding enough or people don't care one way or the other. If your critics are listening to the voice of God, then you need to hear what they're saying. But if they're not, you need to stand fast in his will. And Nehemiah describes to us and demonstrates how to deal with opposition in life. The first sort of slings and arrows that they kind of bring against Nehemiah is anger. You see, Sanballat was the governor of Samaria, and he became furious and very angry. The word here in Hebrew means burning mad, and you can almost kind of see that in him. A secure and independent Jerusalem would threaten his hold on the area, and it would undermine his control of the trade route that was going through the country. And thus, it would hurt the economy. So for the time being, he dropped his differences with the Ammonites to the east and the Arabs to the south and the Philistines to the west. And they were threatening to stop work if violence was necessary. And so this new work of God in Jerusalem threatened everyone's lifestyle. And so they got angry. When I became a Christian, I was a teenager and my priorities shifted. You'd think my family would be really happy about that. But they had their own dreams of me maybe going to Stanford or becoming a lawyer. And the thought of their daughter becoming a low-paid biology teacher or uh, a social worker was not part of the plan. The same thing happens when one spouse gives their life to Christ and the other spouse reacts in anger, maybe because they feel convicted about their lifestyle. But Satan's aim is to get us to cool down our commitment to the Lord and turn away. So when anger doesn't work, oftentimes people resort to sarcasm or mockery. And Satan hauls this one out all the time. Sanballat and his buddies are within hearing distance of the wall and they ask a bunch of sarcastic questions like this. What are those feeble Jews doing? Are they gonna restore it for themselves? Can they offer sacrifices? And what he means is, do they think that they can complete this project and offer sacrifices of thanksgiving? Can they complete it in a day? Can they revive these stones from dusty rubble, even the burned ones? And so after each one of these rhetorical questions, his cronies probably roared with laughter. And then Tobiah turns in this sarcastic barb. If a fox should jump on this poor excuse for a wall, he'd break it down. You know, Satan frequently uses ridicule against those who take a stand for the Lord. If you become a Christian and let it be known, your coworkers or even your friends might mock you and call you a holy roller. They'll be waiting for you to fall into some sort of sin so that they can hoot about it, saying, you know, we knew you were no different. Christians are a bunch of hypocrites. But your commitment to Christ and even your failures threatens their godless lifestyle. So when that doesn't work, when sarcasm and mockery doesn't work, Oftentimes, people will turn to threats and intimidation. The enemy in Nehemiah gets more aggressive. Nehemiah had to be careful. He was working under King Artaxerxes' permission, so they couldn't just rally the troops and march on Jerusalem, or else these folks would be charged with rebellion against the king. But they could use threats of violence, and they circulated those threats amongst all the Jews that were living there. Small bands of terrorists would sneak in and pick off a few people working on the wall. And Sanballat would just tell Artaxerxes that it was a renegade um, you know, group that came in and did this. So many Christians today face threats or pressure to back down and go back to their former lifestyle. And it places them under intense psychological pressure. But Satan still uses subtle and subversive things intimidating you. Maybe it's if you don't keep quiet about this safety concern, you'll get fired. Or maybe it's something like, you know, if you don't work Sundays, you might as well go find another job. Or if you write a paper in defense of the Christian faith, the professor will probably flunk you. Or when an elder doesn't agree with the session, maybe they make a threat not to go along with the majority of vote. And sadly, Many people crumble 
under threats. So when threats and intimidation don't work, maybe they throw out discouragement and exhaustion. Apparently, there was a discouraging word or mantra that was circulating amongst all the workers at this point. Verse 10 says this, The strength of the burden bearers is failing, and yet there's much rubbish. We ourselves are unable to build the wall. You know, when you've been on a project for a really long time, you just get to the point where you're exhausted, especially when there's a whole lot of things that just keep coming and coming and coming, and you've received a lot of opposition. They had lost their earlier heart for the work, and it had resulted in the wall being rapidly built to the halfway mark. But here they are. Satan knows that halfway is the most efficient time to strike. When you get a new project, there's a ton of enthusiasm. You know, let's get it, let's, let's arise, let's build, let's get up early, everybody wants to join in. But when it starts taking a long time, more and more people start to drop out. So if you get over that midway hump, the completion draws near, and then there's this new surge of enthusiasm off ten times again. But right in the middle, when there's rubble that still needs to be removing, they felt like quitting. The same thing is true in your walk with God. When you first became a Christian, you were probably on fire for the Lord. And it's exciting. You think about, wow, you know, I might have a place in winning the world for Christ. But every Bible study at that time that you go to might seem fresh and exciting. Your word, the time that you spend in the word and in prayer, you know, is rich with new discoveries. And you can't seem to get enough of being you know, maybe in church or around the people of God. But somewhere down the line, that newness wears off and you begin to notice the piles of rubble in your own life and the sins and the problems that just don't seem to grow away. And maybe you've grown weary, wondering if all your efforts are really making a difference. And so your weariness leads to discouragement. But Satan is not out of tools yet. He brings about this next one, negative, negativity. So the criticism and mockery that came earlier came from the enemies who were outside their group. And now this negativity comes from the Jews themselves who lived near the enemy. These people, they weren't involved in the rebuilding of the wall. And that's significant. They lived near the enemy. And so thus, they were constantly hearing about all these negative attacks on the work. But they weren't personally involved in the work. They were outside of it. And so they were hearing negative reports and threats, and they didn't know firsthand what God was doing in Jerusalem. But then they came repeatedly, it says, ten times, meaning over and over and over again, to warn Nehemiah and those working on the wall. And then they come up against us in every place that you might turn. Invariably, negativism in the church comes from professing Christians who live near the enemy and who are not involved in the Lord's work. Such negativity is the enemy of faith. There's plenty of people who are willing to point out all the holes in the wall, but they aren't willing to be part of the solution. They need to turn their fingers and point back at themselves and start looking at themselves. There's giants in the land, the folks said in numbers. We're like grasshoppers in their sight. There's no way we can get to that land. So it doesn't just happen in Nehemiah. It happens all through the Old Testament. But there's a proper place for realism. Nehemiah didn't ignore the problems and the dangers that existed. But if he had listened to these prophets of doom and gloom, they would have never finished the wall. So Satan might then pull out this last one, fear. Fear is the cumulative effect like of all of these different things adding up. The people had seen the enemy's anger and they had heard the mockery and threats. They were wearing down through exhaustion and then they repeatedly heard the doom and gloom from their fellow Jews who lived near the enemy. Nehemiah saw their fear and he exhorted them, don't be afraid. Satan uses fear to paralyze God's people and to keep us from ever getting anything significant done. Maybe it's a fear of failure, or maybe you've done it before and you don't know if you can do it. 
maybe it's the fear of rejection. If you try, other people will think you're a fanatic and stand off from you. Or maybe it's the fear of conflict. If you do what God wants you to do and you know you'll catch flack, you back off. So these are some of the tactics that Satan uses against God's people to oppose God's work, both in the projects that we undertake, but also in our individual hearts that want to advance spiritually. And so how do you overcome this opposition? How do we respond to the opposition? Well, we respond with prayer and work and focus on the Lord. And that's exactly what Nehemiah did as well. Often when we face opposition, our first response is to get angry or hit back or defend ourselves. But our first response should always be prayer. John Bunyan wisely observed, you can do more than pray after you have prayed, but you cannot do more than pray until you have prayed. So prayer reminds us that God is sovereign and in control, even over those who are attacking us. And he has allowed this trial for a reason. In prayer, we submit our hearts to God and we acknowledge our trust in him. Last week, we learned that Nehemiah prayed and then acted and then prayed and then acted. He does this over and over again in the book of Nehemiah. But his first response was always to pray. He didn't react to the criticism with anger or retaliation. He asked God for help. So prayer also keeps us from acting out of our anger or our jealousy. So take some time to think things through and don't say something that you'll regret. Be careful who you might recruit into your sin by talking about things. When you go to God first, it helps put everything into perspective. And so Nehemiah, he acknowledged his feelings before God, but his prayer helped him to diffuse his anger and he gained some new perspectives on how to respond and better lead his people. So we've got to be careful with the words that we say. We all face ridicule from time to time, but we need to go to God in prayer and acknowledge that their words and our pain are real, but we need to refocus on Christ. So after Nehemiah prayed, then he went to work. When Sanballat realized that the demoralization wasn't working, he decided to crank up the heat. And at that point, the Jews, remember, were halfway through the project. It was a potentially discouraging time. And so Sanballat recruited a surrounding force and he began plans of attack. Usually, those who um, are enemies of God have no problem turning to violence to thwart the plans of God. And so from every side, they began to launch terrorist attacks against the workers. And Nehemiah trained a little sniper force. Did he? No, he didn't. He prayed. And then he took some practical steps. They posted guards to help watch for the sneak attacks. They protected themselves, but then they also went back to work. And although there was a slight pause when Nehemiah organized the militia, he didn't abandon the work and close down everything just because the enemy was there. They didn't allow the enemy's threats to get their focus onto other issues. They just kept building the wall. And pretty soon, the enemy was on the outside looking up at the wall instead of looking straight across them at the other side of the wall. But you see, we can get really easily sidetracked by trying to put up every single fire and make every single person happy. But walls weren't made to be built by everyone putting in their opinion. We elect elders to lead for a certain amount of time and we respect their leadership and their gifts just as we would want ours respected and valued. And so they might do things totally differently than we would in the same situation. But they're a different person in a different time but they're serving the same Lord Jesus and they want the best for the church and for the community. But they need our support and they need our prayers and they need us to work alongside them, not work against them. And so Nehemiah lastly kept this focus on the Lord. Nehemiah reminded them in, in verse 14 in chapter four, remember the Lord who is great and awesome 
Fight for your brothers, your sons, your daughters, your wives, and your houses. See, the people had gotten discouraged, and they had lost their focus. They had turned it on to the enemy's threats. But all they saw then was piles of rubble and all the work that they had to do. And so Nehemiah rightly directed their focus back on the Lord, who was great and awesome and who gives all things if we even just ask in prayer. And so what happens? They realized that if they gave in to the enemy, they would lose their families. So God gave Nehemiah to restore the confidence of the people and to restore this vision to a discouraged people. They refocused, they regrouped, and they got their families pulling together. So when opposition hits, it's really easy to get your focus off the Lord and onto your own problems. At such time, when you stop, Paul says, set your minds on things above, not on the things that are on earth. So if you're tempted into sin, or you're remembering the devastating effects that it'll have on your family, get God's perspective on your situation. 1 Corinthians 10, 13 is one of my favorite verses in the Bible, and it says this, No testing has overtaken you that is not common to everyone. God is faithful, and he will not let you be tested beyond your strength. And most people end right there. And when we do, it means that we've got to rely on our own strength. But listen to this verse again, all the way through. No testing has overtaken you that is not common to everyone. It's going to happen. It's going to happen to everyone. God is faithful, and he will not let you be tested beyond your strength. But with testing, he will also provide the way out so that you may be able to endure it. So it's with God's strength. It's with God's way out that we will find a way. And so we need to keep our eyes focused on the Lord. Otherwise, we're just doing it on our own strength. So may we learn from Nehemiah as he teaches us that when opposition arises, we can meet it squarely and with integrity and with common sense and in a manner that prevents detours. We can keep building and keep laying the bricks and keep doing what God has called us to do, even when others are trying to tear us down. Because the sad truth is, when we're living for God, and when we're especially seeking to accomplish great things, as I believe this church is doing, not everyone will celebrate and rejoice with us and join with us in the work. Church life and worship and mission may look very, very different when we are finally able to come back together and worship in one place again. Life has changed in a very short amount of time, but it also gives us the chance to look at what's essential and what we're willing to leave behind in the rock pile as we build on the next 10 and 20 years as Trinity United Presbyterian Church. Amen.
Please join me in our affirmation of faith. We believe in a loving God who is life's breath for all Earth's creatures, who is the ground in which our lives flourish, who is the mystery towards which we are all drawn. We believe in the risen Christ, whose life is the way we see God made real, whose death bears witness to the power of love, whose presence nourishes our spirits each day. We believe in the Holy Spirit, who flows a refreshing spring of life, who comes as divine fire to energize the faithful, who creates communities of joy and justice. Today our Lord's Prayer is going to be responsive. Please join me on the bold. O oh God, through Jesus' sacrifice, you have restored us as your forgiven children. In his name we pray, our Father who art in heaven. Help us to know you through your inspired word and to live by it as children in your family. Hallowed be thy name. Give us your Holy Spirit to rule in our hearts and use us to extend your kingdom of grace to others. Thy kingdom come. Make us zealous to carry out your will as gladly as the angels do, and to conform our will to yours. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Merciful Lord, since you are the provider of all things necessary for our bodies, fill us with trust. Give us this day our daily bread. Continue to erase our sins and help us gladly to forgive and to do good to those who wrong us and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. We know the devil seeks to destroy our souls and the world lures us to ruin by appealing to the desires of our flesh. Guard us from the poison of misbelief and the trap of unrepented sin and lead us not into temptation. Keep safe our bodies and souls, our property and honor, and above all, send the Holy Spirit to preserve our faith in Christ which leads to life everlasting, but deliver us from evil. For all these petitions, we look to you as King of kings and Lord of your church, for thine is the kingdom. You alone hold the power to grant our requests and the power. We worship you from whom all blessings flow and the glory forever and ever. Relying on Jesus who canceled our sins and made us acceptable in your sight, we pray with confidence. Amen. May it be so. Now comes the time of worship where we present our gifts and tithes to the Lord to continue his work in our, in our land. All good gifts come from the Lord, and from these riches we bring this offering. Help us to use it for the furtherance of God's purposes in this place and for the benefit of those in need. Amen. Friends, would you please join with me as we recite together our prayer of thanksgiving. Lord Jesus Christ, thank you that you have plans for me that are for my good and your glory. You said, give, and it will be given to you. For in the same measure as you give, it will be given to you again. We give to you today as a response to your goodness to us. We ask that you receive our offerings and continue to supply all of our needs. May your peace be in our hearts, your grace in our words, your love be in our hands, and your joy be in our souls. In your mighty name, amen. 